Welcome to the Caltex Theatre, a full hour of dramatic entertainment broadcast over a nationwide network of stations throughout Australia. The Caltex Theatre is brought to you by Caltex Oil, marketers of over a thousand outstanding petroleum products in association with Caltex dealers and distributors everywhere. Tonight in the Caltex Theatre, you will hear Poison Tongue, the story of the unmasking of a murderer who chose an unusual and cleverly conceived weapon to commit his crime. Starring in Poison Tongue, you will hear Nigel Lovell, your producer, Cressick Jenkinson. <laughs> The Caltex Theatre presents Poison Tongue, Act One. Good Lord, she's hit the lamppost. Just as that girl. shop for a moment. Of course. Oh, that car just missed me. Here, take this chair. I heard the skid and the crash. Couldn't see anything, though. Oh. The, the driver couldn't seem to control the car. Are you hurt? It's, it's nothing much. Only fright. I just needed to sit down. I'll get you some water. Thank you. Oh, it, it took me so much by surprise. I saw the car coming, but I, I was nearly across the street. Then the driver braked suddenly and went into a skid. So I jumped. Then I came in here. Here you are. Oh, thank you. I, I'm sorry to be such a bother. No trouble at all. <laughs> Amazing how quickly a crowd collects, isn't it? A policeman seems to have taken charge. Uh, perhaps you'd better wait until he's seen you. Oh, I don't think I will. I really didn't see anything, and I'm late back to work as it is. I gather you work somewhere near here. I haven't seen you before. I haven't been here long. But I always pass your stamp shop on the way. Are you interested in stamps, by any chance? No, but some of those in the window are very pretty. Afternoon, Bidford. Nasty smash. Yes, it sounded like it. What can I do for you, Minister? Oh, no hurry. I can wait till you've served the young lady. I'm just going, thanks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bidford. Are you sure you'll be all right? And shouldn't you leave your name and address in case the police want to see you? I don't think they will. I doubt if anyone saw me come in. Goodbye and thanks again. Oh, uh, Goodbye. Uh, goodbye. Pretty. No, no long, Bidford. I've never seen her before. What can I get for you? Uh, only a packet of loose leaf sheets. I've seen her before, you know. She's the new assistant at the chemist in the square. Oh. Well, here you are. Anything else? Oh, look. She's left a book behind. Uh, on the chair here. Or is it yours? No, it's probably hers. It's a library book. Might be a name inside. Oh, look, there's an envelope sticking out. A place marker, I expect. Good Lord. Yes, that stamp. What is it? A tuppenny? It was once. It's nearly black now. The date stamps, let's see, a year ago. Never saw a stamp turn that colour before. As you say, it's nearly black. Uh, you said the girl works in a chemist's shop. Maybe she's touched it up with some chemical. The address is written in green ink. Or do you think that's changed colour too? It's hard to say without testing. That stamp will be worth something. What will you do, Bidford? Findings, keepings, or make her an offer? Always supposing it's hers, of course. The envelope's addressed to a Mrs. Carpenter, so it can't be hers. 
She wasn't wearing a ring. No, I noticed that. Pretty girl. Look, um, I'd like to be in on the examination of that stamp, Bidford. Fascinating. All right, Minister. Come round to my flat around eight this evening and we'll have a look at it. Fine. Uh, incidentally, I passed that chemist on my way. I don't mind at all dropping the book into our mysterious lady. I shouldn't trouble, thanks. If it's hers, no doubt she'll be back for it. <laughs> okay, okay. You saw her first. A tuppenny turned black. Absolutely extraordinary. It is rather extraordinary, isn't it? Mr. Bidford and this customer of his, Mr. Minster, were actually examining the stamp when I arrived, Superintendent. Well, go on, Inspector. I called at Mr. Bidford's flat on a more or less routine matter. There was a car smash in the high street yesterday. The driver was a Miss Jennifer Buckingham from Tollingford. Oh, serious? Oh, she's in hospital with concussion. We haven't been able to question her to find out what caused this kid. The car was new and the tires were good. Anyway, one or two of the eyewitnesses mentioned that the car just avoided hitting a girl who went into Bidford's, the stamp dealers. Mm -hmm. Well, sir, the constable didn't hear about her until quite late, when Bidford's was closed, and uh, since I know him slightly, I offered to call round to his flat to ask if he could tell us anything about this girl. And that's how I happened to see the envelope. And what was it like? I'll get it down here to show you as soon as the lab's finished testing, sir. It was a sort of brown, rather like a circular. You know, one of those envelopes uh, addressed in green ink to a Mrs. Carpenter of Bracken Street. But the stamp was oddly discolored, dark purple, nearly black. Naturally, Bidford hopes it may be valuable, and he wasn't too pleased when I said I'd better bring it away and get our lab to test it. Oh, you're quite right, Inspector. Post office are pretty particular about the gums they use. Well, that's what I thought, sir. It seemed worthwhile to make a check anyway. As far as the girl's concerned, by the way, Bidford had never seen her before, but his customer had. He thinks she works for a chemist in the square. And we'll send the man along to talk to her in the morning. Good. Of course, there mightn't be anything in this stamp business, but I thought if only for the sake of the post office people. Yes? Yes, Inspector Waits here. You are? Oh, thank you, sir. Might be the lab report. Hello? I see. Probably derived from a liniment, huh? Uh, just a minute. The gum on that stamp was poisonous, sir. Was it indeed? Uh, excuse me, sir. Any idea what? Uh, well, keep trying. Uh, derived from a liniment. Well, that's a bit more subtle than arsenic or phosphorus. Hmm. Hmm. Yes, please. Uh, a copy for the superintendent, too. Thanks a lot. Well, that certainly explains the discoloration, sir. <laughs> this will upset the big wheels of the post office. Unless it wasn't an accident. Rather odd way to commit a murder. Well, it's certainly original. The lab says licking one or two stamps poison in that way wouldn't do any harm, but if 50 or more were licked in a short space of time... Yes. Well... It was too early to be positive whether it was deliberate or not. Anyway, um, follow it up, wait. Yes, sir. I'll go right round to see this Mrs. Carpenter for a start and see if I can find out where that stamp came from. It'll help if I can trace any others posted about the same time. Yeah, we'll keep the post authorities in touch. Yes, sir. A pity the trail's at least 12 months old, eh? Let's hope it doesn't lead to a cemetery. Good morning, Mr. Bidford. Oh, good morning, Miss... You know, um, you didn't tell me your name yesterday. It's Hedges. I came in to thank you for being so kind to me yesterday. I found it remarkably easy to be kind to you, Miss Hedges. I also wondered if by any chance I left my library book here. Oh, it was yours then. Y yes, you did. It. It's right here. Oh, thank goodness. It belongs to the library, and I was worried about it. Here it is. Oh, thank you. 
Uh, well, I'll... Uh, Miss Hedges. What is it? Miss Hedges, I have a confession to make. I'm afraid I've taken rather a liberty. Oh? What's that? Uh, it'll take rather a lot of explaining, and I expect you're on your way to business. Could you lunch with me? What? I really do have something to explain. Look, I hope you believe this isn't a habit of mine. It's really... Well, well would you, please? <laughs> well, if it will take a load off your mind. Thank you. Shall we say Hatterick's in the square? I could be there just after one. Uh, good morning. Oh, good morning. Excuse me, miss. I'm Detective Inspector Waite. I wonder if you happen to be the young lady who had rather a close shave yesterday. Yes, but I'm afraid I didn't see much, Inspector. Just the car skidding towards me. I almost fell into this shop. Well, that's all I know. Inspector, this young lady's in a hurry. Couldn't you... Yes, of course. If you just jot down your name and address for me. Uh, just routine. If I must, Inspector. Yes, here's an old envelope. Just use the back of that. A pen? Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, there. Thank you, Miss um, Hedges. Oh, by the way, have you ever seen this envelope before? I shouldn't think... Wait a minute, though. That green ink. Mr. Bidford, was this envelope in the book I left here yesterday? If it's addressed to a Mrs. Carpenter, then it was. I don't understand why this detective has it now. Is anything wrong? That's one of the things I want to explain over lunch. I see. <laughs> At least I don't. What can this envelope have to do with the accident? Uh, well, Miss Hedges, if you're in a hurry, perhaps I might walk along with you. All right. I, I hope I can explain, Miss Hedges, at Hatterick's, just after one. Bread, Miss Hedges? Thank you. I, I still can't understand any of this. You say you're a chemist assistant. I'm an assistant dispenser at Fielding's in the square. But what could that have to do? I wondered if possibly you could have spilt some chemical on that stamp while you had the envelope. Oh, I shouldn't think so. I only know it was in the book when I got it from the library. And I left it in the book and the book with my coat in the cloakroom. Did you notice anything odd about the stamp when you first saw the envelope? Only vaguely. It seemed different somehow. But then they altered the colour of stamps so often. But it must have been discoloured when you first saw it. Well, I suppose it must have been, though I can't be sure. Is it of any value to you, Miss Hedges? I, I mean, do you want it back when the police are through with it? Of course not. Any old envelope will do for a bookmark. You keep it if it interests you as a dealer. Well, if the stamp turns out to be valuable, I'll naturally share the proceeds with you. But it's no more mine than anyone else's. Well, I suppose in law it belongs to the library. Anyway, uh, now I've explained. Do you forgive me? Of course. There's nothing to forgive. Mr. Bidford, do you suppose the gum on that stamp was poisoned? What makes you think that? Why else would the police take such an interest? Then that brown envelope and the tuppenny stamp suggest a circular, don't they? Possibly, yes. And if anyone sent out a lot of circulars at a time and licked a lot of stamps, well, if someone had deliberately poisoned the gum, it would be a good way of committing murder, wouldn't it? What a horrible idea. And disposing of the evidence merely by posting the letters. But surely nobody would lick all those stamps. They'd use a sponge. Yes, that's true. But some people are very old-fashioned about that sort of thing. And if the murderer happened to know his victim always licked the stamps... Oh, this is getting nastier and nastier. What a way that would be to die. Yes, it is rather beastly, isn't it? Don't they always say poison is a woman's weapon? Well, they say so. Uh, care for some more tea? No, thank you. Miss Hedges, supposing you were right about this, do you know of any drug that could be used in that way? I can't think of any at the moment. It would have to be colourless and tasteless. I'm not terribly well up in poisons, but I could make inquiries. Perhaps we'd better leave that to the police. We don't want to put a possible murderer on his guard. Oh, it's unlikely that... Oh. Thought of something? No. But if there is a murderer, he or she probably lives in this town and must know about poisons.
poisons. It might be anyone at all. It might even be me. <laughs> what nonsense. In all the thrillers I've read, the murderer is always the least likely suspect. Uh, that'd be the detective, strictly speaking. <laughs> yes, so it would. Yes, coming across that stamp by accident when he thought all the evidence had been destroyed and taking it away from you as he did. You'll soon have me taking you seriously. <laughs> oh, no, don't do that. Well, there probably isn't even a murderer at all. <laughs> is there? Yes, it may all be in Mayor's Nest, Superintendent. But uh, Mrs. Carpenter says she used to get a lot of circulars in envelopes like that about a year ago. Uh, a request for charity, and uh, as luck would have it, she even found one of the circulars. Yes, sir. The, the circular requested that contributions be sent to the head office of the charity at the home of a Miss Ann Dolar. D-O-L-E-R. Yes, sir. Miss Dolar of Pencroft, Gatsy Lane. And when I called at Gatsy Lane, I heard that Miss Dolor had died a year ago and that you, Dr. Marlowe, were her attendant physician. Aye, that is so. And could you tell me in simple terms the cause of her death? Oh, disease of the heart, Inspector. Miss Dolor was 83 years old and uh, oh, her heart was naturally weak. Do I understand her death came as no surprise to you, Doctor? I'd warned her many times against overexertion, of course. Meaning that she was more active than was wise in her condition? <laughs> Miss Dolor's mind was extremely vigorous. He didn't like to be told to slow up. Well, it's hard for any of us to realize that we aren't as young as we used to be. But uh, had Miss Dolor, to your knowledge, done anything or suffered any kind of physical or mental shock that might have hastened her death? Nothing whatever. Her death, in my view, was due to the inevitable running down of uh, overworked machinery. Hmm. Well, thank you, Dr. Marlowe. Now, could you by any chance tell me the name of Miss Dolor's solicitor? Hello, Miss Hedges. Enjoy your lunch at Hatterick's? Yes, thanks, Mr. Fielding. But how did you know? Oh, I happened to glance out the window and saw you coming out. Oh. Am I allowed to ask who he is, Miss Hedges? Just a chance acquaintance. Mr. Bidford from the stamp shop. Well, he hasn't taken long to get into your good graces. I'll have to ask him how it's done. These prescriptions came in while you were out, Mr. Fielding. Ah, yes. Let's see now. Well, uh, you can do this one and this one and, and this. Mm -hmm. All proprietary stuff. And I'll see the others. Right. I wonder why old Stubbs has been ordered tranquilizers. His wife getting a bit out of hand again, do you think? How should I know? Ah, you won't be a good dispenser until you take a personal interest in your prescribees. What possible use can that be? It doesn't change the formula. Ah, uh, gives you an insight. People don't realize how much their prescriptions tell a chemist. I could name every hypochondriac in town. And others, well, you just know. That they won't get better, you mean? Yes, rather beastly, isn't it? Trouble is, I'm too sentimental, and sometimes I feel like bunging a touch of strychnine in their medicine just to help them off. You'd finish up on the gallows. Oh, if I ever took it in my head to poison someone, nobody would ever find out. Weed killer? Nah. Rat poison? Bah. What's the use of having a training like mine if you can't be a bit subtle? Do you know a lot about poisons, then? Borgia is my middle name. Oh. I... I was reading a thriller the other day, and... I thought it was rather ingenious. The murderer removed the gum from some uh, some envelopes and replaced it with some hid dope. Whereupon the victim burst into flames and exploded. <laughs> no, simply died. And the letters were posted, so there was nothing to show how the poison had been administered. But they didn't tell what the poison was. And a very good thing, too. It might have put ideas into people's heads. Is there such a poison, Mr. Fielding? That you wouldn't notice, even if you lick the gum on a lot of envelopes. Oh, most unsanitary proceeding. Always use a sponge, young woman. Oh, there's old Stubbs for his tranquilizers. Go and deal with him, there's a good girl. Advise him to slip one into his wife's morning cuppa. It's a good thing I know you, or I might take you at your word. Here you are, Mr. Stubbs. Nothing to pay. Thank you. 
Oh. The poor old chap looks like a nervous wreck. Mr. Fielding, or should I call you Bourgeois? Oh, make it, Jimmy. Think how much time you'd save in a year. No, Mr. Fielding, it wouldn't be respectful. Oh, how much you care about that? What's Bidford's first name? How should I know? Uh, we were talking, if you remember, about poisons. A half a moment. Now, this formula is rather tricky. I don't want to make any mistake in consequence of my mind running on... On what, Mr. Fielding? An old dehydrin. Oh. There, now that's done. And I hope it does her good. Although, I don't know... Is she one of those? Uh, afraid so. However, that'll keep her out of pain for a bit. Now, next... Detective Inspector Waite, Mr. Burnscott. Oh, hello, Waite. Come in and sit down. Thank you. Well, is this friendly call or business? A mm, bit of both, maybe. Yeah. Ah. Cigarette. Thanks, Mr. Burnscott. That's the idea. How have you been keeping abreast of the local crime wave? Crime wave? <laughs> Not even a ripple. <laughs> Expect your job's livelier than mine, though. All those divorce cases. Anyway, uh, what brings you here? Oh, just idle curiosity. Just something that seems to warrant a spot of investigation. Maybe nothing at all. I'm suitably intrigued. Uh, Miss Anne Dola was one of your clients, wasn't she? Oh, Miss Dola? No, no, she's been dead a year or more. Yes, we were her solicitors. Did you ever meet her? Once or twice. Um, Oldham actually handled her affairs, but I had a few dealings with her when he was sick or on holiday. What did you make of her? Oh, funny old party. Strong-minded, to put it mildly. In other words, a bit cantankerous and a bit of a crank. <laughs> Between ourselves, that is. Great one for charitable causes, Miss Dola. I gather she'd been in poor health for years. Yes, but she took it in her stride. Or tried to. Never admitted defeat. I say she led us servants a devil of a life, yet somehow they were all devoted to her. I've heard she wasn't so lucky with her paid companions. Well, no. There, there was quite a succession of them. Until she found the one who was with her when she died. Uh, Nurse Butcher. Yeah, Janet Butcher, yeah. No. Stayed two years, thus smashing all previous records. Uh, what became of her after Miss Dola died? I have no idea. After the will was proved and executed, she went away. I've not heard of her since. Was she a beneficiary then? Nurse Butcher? Good Lord, yes. She came in for everything. Did she now? Yes, the house, practically all the old lady's money. Oh, there were one or two bequests to the servants and so on, but nothing of great account. Oh, Nurse Butcher swiped the jackpot. Over twenty thousand pounds when everything was cleared up. That's very interesting indeed. And uh, she just vanished. Well, I wouldn't put it like that, Inspector. We were the executors, of course. There was no reason why she should keep in touch with us or we with her. She simply moved away, that's all. May have taken another job, for all I know, or gone on the spree. Miss Dola must have liked her very much, or been very grateful to her. Well, I... I don't know. Look, um, what I'm going to tell you is very much off the record, and I wouldn't repeat it outside these four walls. Mm, it sounds like the sort of gossip that makes a detective's life worth living. <laughs> Anything to help a pal. Uh, outside the witness box. No, I... Um, I have an idea... And Oldham had the same impression that it was a bit of pique on the old lady's part. Huh? Yeah. The will was made only about six weeks before she died, and before that, everything was to have gone to her nephew. What made her change her mind? I, I know you'll find it hard to believe, but simply because the young chap bought a second-hand car. What? Why did that upset her? Well, I, I told you she was a bit of a crank. She had a positive horror of extravagance of any kind. Spent most of her time sending out circulars in aid of various charities, but, oh, never subscribed a penny to them herself. Really? Absolutely. Nor was any of them mentioned in her various wills. Her uh, various wills? Oh, yes, yes. Changing her will was one of her few hobbies. Oh, I see. Well, she didn't have a car of her own? Good Lord, no. She hated them. Nurse Butcher rode a bicycle when she came to town, yeah, what made it worse in his aunt's eyes was that the nephew bought his on the never-never. You see, her motto was cash on the nail, and discount for cash if she could get it. Hmm. 
<laughs> yes, I'm beginning to get the picture. You should. Actually, I believe the whole sum involved was about a hundred and something pounds. But it cost that poor young devil twenty thousand. Well, how did he take it? Oh, good humouredly enough. He's a pleasant chap. When did he hear the bad news? After she died or before? Uh, that I couldn't say for sure. Afterwards, I'd think. At the will reading. I see. Mind you, he promptly wasn't expecting anything, knowing Miss Dola. All he knew, she could have left the lot to charity. Or to him. No. Anyway, he didn't get a penny. I, I think a lot of people had a su surprise when Nurse Butcher came in for the kitty. Including Nurse Butcher? No, no, I can't say. Did you ever meet her? No, only once. Not bad looking, really. Well spoken, ladylike, but um, very quiet. Would you know her again if you saw her? Well, no, I can't call her face to mind. I doubt if I'd recognize her in the street. Look, if you want a description, I suggest you try young Fielding. Fielding? No, yeah, the chemist in the square. Rumour had it he was very attracted in that quarter at one time. Oh, I'll do that. Uh, come on, Inspector, while the questions. Uh, well, I'd just like to get in touch with Miss Janet Butcher, but uh, not so as to stir up a lot of talk. Ah. You might get at her through a bank. We sent her a cheque, and we keep return cheques quite a time, so the accountant would still have it, I think. Any, any help? Definitely. Right. Uh, the accountant, please. Uh, oh, uh, Mr. Tracy, uh, let me have the cheque we paid to Miss Janet Butcher in connection with the will of Miss Andola, will you? About ten to twelve months ago, I think. Yes, thank you. Well, Inspector, anything else I can do for him? You might give me the name and address of the nephew, if you will. Well, didn't I give it to you? Yeah, yes, I did, young um, Jimmy Fielding. What, the chemist? Certainly, the chemist. He was her only living relative. That's curious, sir, and curious, sir. Hmm? You say you know Mr. Fielding? Oh, casually only. I told you, a very pleasant chap. He certainly has a tendency to crop up in this case. He's Susan Hedge's boss, Miss Butcher's former admirer, Miss Dola's sole relative and presumed natural heir. And he's a chemist. You know, I think that sounded pretty sinister. I knew what this was all about. No, I'm sorry, Mr. Burnscott. But the sooner I have a word with your young Mr. Fielding, the better. And so the curtain falls on Act One of tonight's Caltech's play, Poison Tongue. Anywhere you can to travel, motorists agree. Motorists agree that Caltex butane boosted gasolines take better care of your car's performance. You get faster starts, smoother acceleration, more economical running. Change to Caltex butane boosted gasoline and feel the difference. The Caltex Theatre now presents Nigel Lovell in Poison Tongue. Act Two. Only ten minutes to closing time. Thank goodness, Miss Hedges. Yes, Mr. Fielding? Uh, tell me, how goes the romance with the stamp shop? Why? I haven't even seen Mr. Bitford since I had lunch with him, and that's a week ago. Oh, splendid. Why splendid, Mr. Fielding? Because... Uh, talk of the devil. Miss Hedges, you'd better see to this customer. Right. Good evening, Mr. Bitford. What can I get you? Uh, good evening, Miss Hedges. Um, uh, have you uh, something for a headache? Not ordinary tablets. They don't agree with me. I'll see what Mr. Fielding recommends. Mr. Fielding... What can you suggest? Tell him to try a meat axe. Oh, shut up. What shall I offer him? Well, try these nice big tablets. Perhaps he'll choke himself. Oh, thank you, Mr. Fielding. I, I think you'll find these as good as anything, Mr. Bidford. Oh, thank you. No, don't bother to wrap it up. Oh, one and uh, ninepence, please. 
Uh, oh, yes, of course. Thank you. Um, Miss Hedges, I, I wonder... Well, if you happen to be free this evening, would you care to see a film? W with me, that is. But should you, if your head aches? Oh, it doesn't ache now, but it may come on sometime when the shops are shut. Is that when your head usually begins to ache? Well, no, I can't say I... Look, let's forget about headaches. How about the film? Very well. Thank you. Oh, good evening, Inspector. Good evening, Miss Hedges. Evening, Bidford. Uh, is Mr. Fielding available? Uh, yes, sir. Oh, here he is. Uh, this is Inspector Waite, Mr. Fielding. Hello, Inspector. What can I do for you? Toothache, earache, heartache? We've cures for everything. Now you can run along, Miss Hedges. I'll shut up shop. Thank you. Miss Hedges. Half past seven, outside the cinema. Good, fine, thank you. Uh, I'll see you then. Uh, thank you, Mr. Fielding. I'll just get my things. Good night. Good night. Good night, Inspector. Oh, good night, Miss Hedges. Oh, you see, Inspector. What do those young things care about my broken heart? Nothing, whatever. Mm, pretty girl. Very. Have you come shopping or are you on some trail? Oh, well, neither. I'd just like a chat with you. Oh, my flat's upstairs. We can talk there in peace and comfort. I'll just lock up the shop. Oh, thank you. Uh, this way, Inspector. I hear there was a car crash outside Bidford's last week. Anyone hurt? A uh, driver had a touch of concussion. Local resident? No. Tollinghurst. She's back home now. Uh, no use laying in a special stock of sticking plaster, then. Ah, oh, here we are. Sit down and make yourself home. Now for your drink? Uh, no, thanks. But uh, go ahead yourself. Oh, later will do. You're very comfortable here. And the whole art of life, Inspector, lies in gracious living. Well, now, what's on your mind? Mr. Fielding, I believe you were a relative of Miss Ann Dola. Uh, she was my aunt. Why? Are you familiar with her handwriting? Oh, yes. The old lady never failed to send me a card at Christmas and on my birthday, however much she disapproved of me in between. Uh, well, this envelope, uh, is it addressed in your aunt's hand? Oh, no. No, she never used green ink and her writing was angular and old-fashioned. Uh, but I can tell you whose it is if you're interested. Well, uh, the detective can never know too much. My aunt had a nurse who acted as companion and secretary as well, a certain Miss Butcher. That's her writing. You're quite sure? Oh, good Lord, yes. She spent lots of her time addressing envelopes to my aunt's charities. Did any of these circulars come to you? Well, my aunt knew me better than that. Well, then how are you so certain about this writing? Oh, Janet Butcher used to write to me personally. Oh, I see. As a matter of fact, I was rather keen on her at one time. Didn't come to anything. None of my youthful follies ever did. You don't happen to have a photograph of her? No, I never saw one. Could you describe her? Are you looking for an inspector? Well, perhaps I want to return a bicycle pump she left at Pencroft. <laughs> a lot of use she'd have for it, with 20,000 smackers in the bank. Uh, let's see. Aged about 28. Middle height, middling brown hair, grey eyes, I think. Yes, I'm pretty well sure. A quiet and reserved... A neat figure, but you wouldn't look back over your shoulder at her in the street. Uh, not being very helpful, am I? What became of her after your aunt died? And she stayed on until the will was settled. I don't know where she went after that. May I take it that you'd lost interest in her movements by then? Huh? Oh, months and months before. I don't think now why I found her so very attractive. Probably because she wasn't, well, obvious. She hadn't quite an astringent wit, and I think that's what endeared her to my aunt. Did she, by any chance, write to you at about the time of your aunt's death? No. Well, at least she did address an envelope from Aunt Anne. Containing a letter? Uh, no, a birthday card. It was my birthday a couple of days before the old lady died. You wouldn't still have the card, I suppose. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I think I have. I kept it because it was, well, my last link with Aunt Anne, but I can't say I've looked at it since. And care to see it? Yes, if it's no trouble. Oh, none at all. It's somewhere in my desk. Let's see. Oh, here's a photograph of Aunt Anne taken about three years ago. <laughs> Is that Nurse Butcher with her? Ah, uh, no, that's her predecessor, one Hermione Lester. She only stayed a few weeks. I'm sure I put that card in here somewhere. Hermione couldn't stand watching the old lady lick stamps. Oh. I don't think I could either. Auntie had rather a large tongue. Anyhow, after that, I sent Auntie one of those sponge things which properly sent the balloon up, wasting money on it. Ah, here we are. Good Lord. What is it, Mr. Fielding? 
The stamp, it's nearly black. Hmm. Oi, oi. Now I wonder if she's quite so naive as she likes us to believe. Whom do you mean, Janet Butcher? No. Uh, Mr. Fielding, may I take that envelope? Uh, no, Inspector, you may not. I'd like to have a good look at that stamp. Have you any objection? Well, it's for you to say at the moment, Mr. Fielding. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, one more thing. In her condition, I suppose your aunt took medicine. Quite a bit, I imagine. Was it sent up to the house or called for? I wouldn't know. I didn't make up her prescriptions for obvious reasons. Obvious, Mr. Fielding? Oh, surely. My aunt was reputedly rich and old and had a dicky heart. I asked her to send her prescriptions elsewhere, and she saw my point and did so. The point being that you might be a legatee. Oh, she made no secret of that. Nor when I was out of favour either. I was in and out of her will so often that it was almost like the football pools. Not that it troubled me much. Well, I should have thought that uh, 20,000 pounds was worth a bit of trouble. Oh, money's not everything, Inspector. Anyway, I didn't feel disposed to order my life according to my aunt's ideas merely for what she might leave me. Oh, I see. I think Janet was surprised at the reading of the will. <laughs> that I didn't come in for anything, and that she got the lot, I mean. Or if she wasn't surprised, then she put on a jolly good act. Wait a minute. If I thought she'd done the old lady any harm, I'd... Were you surprised, Mr. Fielding? Huh? Were you surprised at the contents of that will? I told you, Inspector, I was in and out again so often, I, I didn't really know till the will was read whether I'd be in or out. Hmm. Thank you, Mr. Fielding. I get the impression that you were fond of your aunt. Aunt Anne was very kind to me in a Spartan way when my parents died. Yes, I, I was more than fond of her. If I can help you in any way, Inspector, I'll do anything. Well, you could start by letting me have that envelope. Just what and whom do you suspect, Inspector? No, of course, I shouldn't ask. Well, here, take the envelope. Thank you, Mr. Fielding. That will be all for now. There'll be plenty of time for coffee before the show's due to start. Uh, cigarette, Miss Hedges? Uh, no, thanks. Have any more of those queer stamps turned up, Mr. Bidford? No, and I hope they won't. It'll only bring the price down. You know, it's strange. We only met a week ago, but I feel as if we're old friends. I hope you do. I suppose if anybody found one of those stamps, they'd bring it to you. Well, I'm the only stamp shop for miles. Oh, thanks. Uh, what? Both white, sir. Well, uh, this is very pleasant. Sugar? Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Bidford, you remember you asked me what poison might have been used on those stamps? Well, I believe I've found out. Have you indeed? What is it? A mildehydrin. I think it must be one of the fairly new ones because it isn't in the books yet. Oh. Have you told the inspector? Oh, goodness, no. Why should I? Oh, look. Talking of the inspector, there he is over the road. He's knocking at the door of our shop. The place is closed up, isn't it? Oh, Mr. Fielding lives upstairs. But the inspector was there just a few hours ago. Why on earth would... Would he want him again so soon? I have no idea. Did you gather what he wanted you with your boss earlier on? No, Mr. Fielding said I could go. I left right after you. You look pretty worried. Is anything wrong, do you think? I hope not. Surely Fielding can't be concerned in this poison stamp business. Oh, no. No, of course not. Though it was he who told me about Amilda Hydron. Oh, he's coming out. He's getting into the car with the inspector. You don't think he's been arrested, do you? Well, more than likely they've gone off for a drink together. The inspector isn't always on duty, you know. Oh, that's probably it. They seem to be friendly. I yes, yes, of course. That's probably it. <laughs> Ritter didn't give me much notice, Mr. Fielding, but there's nothing like striking while the iron's hot. I suppose you're quite sure, Inspector. Oh, not by any means. That's why I asked you to come with me. 
But the signature on the driving license was written in green ink, and our expert is pretty positive it's the same writing. And then again, uh, Jennifer Buckingham, Janet Butcher. Good Lord, yes. Now, most people who take a false name keep their own initials, though some are original enough to reverse them. How did you get onto it? Well, my sergeant spotted the writing on the driving license, and he's got green ink on his mind. Spent an exhausting week trying to find some more discolored stamps. Do you have any luck? Yes, found several. You know, it's funny how people keep old letters in drawers or stuck behind the clock in the dining room. I've just been looking through mine. Two years old, some of them. I noticed quite a bunch on Bidford's mantelpiece, too, when I looked in there the other evening. And at my place, I don't doubt. Yes, if everyone were methodical and scrapped old letters, well... We never have come across this at all. I wonder if it wouldn't have been better. To avoid scandal, yes. But for the prevention of further crime, no. Are you friendly with Bidford? Oh, I get to know a lot of people in my job. He seems to be getting on like a house on fire with my assistant. Lost his eyes. How long has she been with you? Only a few weeks. She was in training at a London hospital before that. Why? Well, perhaps I... I wondered if she had anything to do with your losing interest in Janet Butcher. You don't miss much, do you, Inspector? Now, oh, here we are. Oh, hello, Jenkins. Is she inside? Yes, sir. I came in about an hour ago. Right. Wait here. <coughs> I'll ring. Mr. Feeling, you stand in front. All right. Yes. Janet. Janet Butcher. Well, now. Jimmy, what a lovely surprise. Come along in. Oh, who's this? I am Detective Inspector Waite, madam. Don't tell me Jimmy's under arrest. Oh, come in. Do you want me to stand bail or something? I should like you to answer a few questions, if you will. What about? Your accident. Oh, that... Well, I'm not feeling too well since I left hospital. Oh, won't you sit down? I had a slight concussion, you know, and I'm afraid my memory of what happened isn't very clear. Jimmy, are you with the inspector? Well, if I may explain, Miss... Miss Buckingham, I had reason to believe that you were, in fact, Miss Janet Butcher. I asked Mr. Feeling to come along and identify you. That was quite unnecessary, Inspector. I should have admitted it. Oh? If you were a youngish woman who'd been poor and worked hard all her life and were called Nurse Butcher and had to suffer all the feeble, obvious jokes and, and then came into a fair amount of money, you'd understand it. I decided to start a new life with a new name. Well, I do understand, Miss Butcher. Though your cutting adrift from old connections didn't extend to changing the colour of your ink. <laughs> no, someone once told me that green ink was lucky. No, it's quite so. I gather that your accident was caused by a dog running into the road. Yes, I had to brake very hard to miss it. Then the car got into a skid and I couldn't pull out. It's a heavy car and I haven't been driving so very long. About how long, Miss Butcher? Oh, three months. I travelled for eight months before I settled in Tollinghurst. From the skid marks, I gather that you were crossing to the off side of the road. Well, yes, yes. Perhaps I was going rather faster than I should, and then I remembered that I wanted something from one of the shops on the other side of the high street. I suppose that would account for the skid. Yes, well, I'm glad to have your confirmation, because we never regarded that bit of road as dangerous. Uh, did you find it so when you rode a bicycle on it? Well, can't say I did. You seem to know a good deal about me, Inspector. Well, it's all part of my job, Miss Butcher. Well, I think that's all about the accident, too. Uh, Oh, by the way, uh, this envelope is addressed in your handwriting, isn't it? Yes. Why? Do you notice anything odd about the stamp? So that's why it tasted strange. What do you mean, Miss Butcher? The stamp has changed colour. Now, the postmark is about a year old. Now, I remember that some stamps I used then tasted strange and bitter. There must have been something wrong with them. Why do you remember it so clearly? Well, that's 
difficult to answer with Jimmy... Mr. Fielding here. Oh, don't mind me. I can explain everything. Oh, well, of course, I'm sure there was no harm in it, but the stamps were some that Mr. Fielding brought me. I wondered at the time if he'd handled them when there was some chemical on his fingers. Mr. Fielding, can you recall the circumstances? Yes. Miss Butcher phoned me to bring up a sheet of stamps, as she wasn't well and couldn't go out, and it was the maid's half day, and my aunt wouldn't ask the cook. And did the request surprise you? Oh, not really. I was often called on to do odd jobs, my aunt. Hmm. Uh, Miss Butcher, you say that stamps tasted bitter. Did you always lick them, then? Uh, yes, it was one of Miss Dola's fads. She wouldn't hear of my using the sponge Jimmy bought her. Oh, she had very strong prejudices, many of them quite unreasonable. Wasn't that so, Jimmy? Yes, but I never heard that she asked her nurses to lick stamps for her. And did the stamps have any harmful effect on you, Miss Butcher? Oh, no, no. I only used one or two that day, then my cold got worse and I went to bed, so Miss Dola finished that batch of circulars herself. Did you mention that the stamps had an odd taste? Can't remember. Perhaps not. And if Miss Dola had noticed anything odd about them, she wouldn't have gone on licking them. She'd have raised Cain with the post office at once. During your two years with Miss Dola, did you ever notice a strange taste on any other stamps? No, never. And yet you must have licked a great many in that time. Literally thousands. Well, you had a lucky escape, Miss Butcher. We've traced several envelopes from that batch of circulars, and we're reasonably sure that the gum of the stamps was deliberately poisoned. Poisoned? Jimmy, how could you? Is this the moment, Inspector, for my dramatic arrest? Do you suppose, Miss Butcher, that the poison was meant for you? Well, obviously, since... Oh, the poor thing. She had it instead of me. It's never safe to jump to conclusions, Miss Butcher. You seem to assume that it was Mr. Fielding who poisoned those stamps with the intention of killing you. And didn't I, Inspector? Well, did you, Mr. Fielding? No, Inspector, I did not. But I'm hoping to find out who did. You're not suggesting I did, Jimmy. Well, may I just put a few facts to you, Miss Butcher? Then you can tell me if I'm wrong anywhere. About six weeks before Miss Dola died, she altered her will in your favor. Oh, yes, You knew I... she might change it again, so you decided she must die before she could. How dare you! After you had hit on the ingenious idea of poisoning the stamps, you needed a confederate who could supply you with a suitable drug. You realize that what you are saying is actionable. I must take that chance. For some time, you'd been carrying on a clandestine affair. What? But not so secretly that it wasn't suspected by Miss Dola's maid, whom I interviewed just this evening. You should know better than to listen to servants' gossip. Your confederate supplied you with a sheet of poison stamps. Miss Dola licked them and died. You posted the letters, thus disposing of the evidence, or so you believed. I think you assumed that no one would bother keeping old circulars or their envelopes for very long. A sad misreading of human nature, Miss Butcher. Oh, this is all, all absolutely... Please, let me go on. You cashed in on your inheritance and cleared out. With, of course, the help of your confederate. After a year, it seemed safe to pick up the threads. You wrote to your lover, but meanwhile he had cooled off. Perhaps he felt a share of your fortune wasn't worth the risk of being married to you. I gather he's also become attracted elsewhere of late. Jimmy, how can you sit there and let this man say such things? Fascinating, isn't it? I'm positively enthralled. You came to see your lover, but an accident prevented your meeting quite unknown to him. Ironic, Miss Butcher, that the skidding of your car brought all this to light. What do you mean? You almost hit a young lady who sought refuge in a nearby shop, a stamp dealer's shop, and left behind her a library book with this envelope in it. Naturally, a dealer would take an interest in a discolored stamp so did a regular customer of his. I know nothing about such things. Is that true, Janet? You used to be very interested in stamps. I, I have a nephew who collects them, that's all. Oh, this is all beside the point. But is it? Didn't you call at the stamp shop quite often at one time? 
I also called at the chemist shop in the square quite often, didn't I, Jimmy? But not to buy medicine for your nephew. That's a cruel thing to say. It's a cruel thing you did, Janet, and are trying to do now. How can you say that, you of all people? Why not? I didn't poison those stamps. Janet, it was Bidford, wasn't it? Bidford? Now I know you're insane. Anyway, who says they were poisoned? I do, Miss Butcher. The body of Miss Dolor has been exhumed and the cause of death ascertained beyond doubt. Oh. Did she suffer from sciatica? Sciatica? Not to my knowledge. Do you? No, why do you ask? As a trained nurse, you know the constituents of sciatica liniment. I... I've forgotten. Mr. Fielding, can you tell Miss Butcher? I can indeed, but it didn't come out of my shop. Inspector, I'm going... You know where. Will you try to stop me? No, I'm coming with you. I have some awkward questions to ask Mr. Bidford about his sciatica prescriptions. Come on, then. Jimmy, wait. Inspector, what... What about me? You're not forgotten, Miss Butcher. Believe me. As you'll find out if you attempt to leave this house. Oh. <laughs> Jenkins, Brown. Keep an eye on Miss Butcher here. Yes, sir. <laughs> Mr. Fielding. Ah, oh, bonjour to you, young Susan. I just heard. The inspector told me. Was it really, Mr. Bidford? Uh, that upsets you, I suppose. Yes. I'm sorry. What on earth made the inspector say? Well, to begin with, he noticed a letter, a recent one, addressed in a familiar writing and green ink in Bidford's flat the first time he went there. It was the same writing as on the envelope that Bidford was examining, but he didn't say a word about recognising the writing. Well, that was a beginning, and there were also some rather suspicious books on Bidford's shelves, such as the British Pharmaceutical Codex. Yes. All straws in the wind at the time. And then Aunt Anne's maid knew Janet was having an affair with someone. She'd heard Janet talking on the phone to someone named Harvey, but she'd never heard his surname. Harvey? Harvey Bidford. That was his first name, Susan. Oh. In a way, I'm sorry for him. I imagine Janet pushed him into it. She has a very compelling personality. It has upset you, hasn't it? Mr. Fielding. Uh, Jimmy. I thought... I was afraid... It was you. If I'd done it, they'd never have found out. Do I understand you're glad I'm not the villain? You don't know how glad. I didn't know either until I started to suspect you. You mean you... Darling! Oh, be quiet, Jimmy. Did he use amyl dehydrin? <laughs> not unless someone's invented it while I wasn't looking. Not bad for the spur of the moment, was it? You, you mean you made it up? Oh, no wonder I couldn't find it in the Codex. Oh, I don't encourage the study of poisons by the girl who's going to be my wife. Am I, Jimmy? Well, are you, Susan? Do you know? I, I rather think I am. No, not here. Jimmy! No. <laughs> So ends our Caltex play, Poison Tongue. In a moment, we will give you tonight's cast and tell you about next week's presentation in the Caltex Theatre. Ladies and gentlemen, the producer of tonight's Caltex play, Cressick Jenkinson. Thank you. Poison Tongue was written by Christopher Maitland and adapted for radio by Kay Keaveney. In the starring role you heard... I played Inspector Waite. This was Nigel Lovell. <laughs> the supporting cast was as follows. Susan Marcia Hathaway. Fielding, Jerome White. Bidford, Max Osberston. Minster, Alton Harvey. The Superintendent and Dr. Marlowe, Frank Taylor, Bern Scott, Moray Powell, Janet Butcher, Diana Perryman.
Thank you, Mr. Jenkinson. Now, this is your compere, Rick Hutton, bidding you good night on behalf of your hosts, Caltex Oil, marketers of Caltex Super Gasoline and Caltex Gasoline, the world famous RPM 1030 Special Motor Oil, and Marfac Lubrication. Thank you.